Good evening. Oh, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> the Zoom lady got me. Good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to the last lecture of the year of our series. I expect to hear boos and sighs of despair. <laughs> But on the brighter side of things, now that the, the clocks have gone forward and it's light outside, we've got a fantastic field trip season to look forward to. So if you haven't already done so, look in the newsletter or on the website and sign up for those. I think places are going like hotcakes. And there's a rich and varied uh, itinerary for our field season. So do get involved in that. Um, that's the only other thing I the only other thing I have to say is for those of you on Zoom, now if I look direct at the camera now, that might might help. You'll notice that the format's somewhat different this evening. Um, for our last lecture, we're using the, the university computers because I think it makes the audio a little bit easier. And we've had a couple of little hiccups with the audio previously. And it will also make um, pointing at various things on the screen easier for all the, the Zoom watchers out there. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Graham now to introduce our speaker for this evening. Sorry, what's it finished with? Not yet, on there? Thank you. Okay, good evening, everyone. Um, I should get my notes visible, shouldn't I? Um, as, uh, as Tom said, the last uh, lecture of the session, and to all of the Zoomers, as it were, and to people in the room, if you do have uh, suggestions for the program next year, um, or next session, then please do fire those into me. I have uh, one or two ideas that, that we can explore for the, uh, for the next session, but uh, I'm always open to ideas. And in fact, that makes my life quite easy because I can then adopt those ideas uh, and people do get to hear what they uh, wanted to hear as it were, rather than uh, have what my choices are uh, pushed down the throat as it were. Um, this evening, um, Following on really a, a paper that I think got a BBC press release at the time uh, and spotted and I thought, ah, now there's a, a good subject for uh, Edmund Allsock audiences. Uh, I'm very pleased to be uh, able to welcome to, to Edinburgh. He did say he was glad to uh, get out of Sheffield, but that's maybe a little bit rough on Sheffield perhaps, but uh, to welcome uh, Professor Mark uh, Bateman. Uh, Mark is a, a graduate, I think, of the University of London in 1991, thereabouts, um, and then a Doctor of Philosophy uh, achieved four years later, University of Sussex, uh, and then joined Sheffield in 1995, where I think, uh, Mark, you sort of were responsible for the luminescence labs as your kind of primary role, but you joined the teaching staff, or the, the full-time teaching staff, as a lecturer in physical geography in 1998, rising to the level of professor in 2011. And uh, if you uh, look at Mark's uh, web pages, uh, the university web pages, you'll see a long list of uh, research publications and research activities, including what we are going to hear about this evening, um, which. Uh, uh, when I saw the paper, as I said, this sounds like good material, um, interesting and fascinating material for the Edinburgh Jolsock audience. So uh, I look forward to hearing uh, tonight about the impact of the Storega tsunami in the North Sea and beyond, um, and impacts on my part of the world on the East Coast, Montrose up to Aberdeen and, and that sort of part of the world. So, Mark, thank you very much. technical glitch and I haven't even started. No, no, that was it. <laughs> Can you hear me at the back okay? 
Well, it's a great pleasure to come up to uh, Edinburgh. I, I think Graham's slightly distorted what I said. It, I, it was after two years of effects being locked down in Sheffield that I was glad of an excuse to come somewhere else in, in, in the UK. So that was the context. Um, always slightly nervous talking to a, a group of geologists, being a lowly geographer who spent his academic career gardening in the Quaternary. But um, hopefully I can give to you this evening a, a quite what I found as a fascinating story that I've hopefully contributed a little bit to. So I'm going to call myself not the speaker for tonight, but more the storyteller, because I'm building on a lot of work that other people over at least 30 years have done. And there may well be experts in this audience that have heard the Sturega uh, story before. And um, I think it's worth retelling, uh, even if you've heard it before. And we have done some new research, which Graham alluded to, that got surprising amounts of press coverage last year. Um, so as ever, there's a team behind this. Um, big thanks to Rob Ashurst, uh, who looks after the samples in the luminescence lab. Uh, and then to John Hill, who did some of the modeling work I'm gonna show you. Uh, and then Tim Carnard, Rebecca Bateman, and Ruth Robinson at St. Andrews. Rebecca Bateman gets a special mention because she's my daughter. Uh, and it was her first publication with her name on, so she got very excited about that. And she's doubly pleased that I'm coming to this society this evening, because when she was at St Andrews doing her geology uh, degree, she did the geological mapping in the Ellie area, which I believe this society has now funded the information board, which is going to be based on the mapping she did. So she was very pleased. That, so thanks. she says thank you very much for funding that. Anyway. On to tonight's talk, which is all about tsunamis, uh, and um, what I thought would be good to start with, and I can't use that, can I? No. No, let's just use... No. no. <laughs> Who's heard of the Sturega story before? One person, yeah. yeah. Two, yes. So I thought we'd, oh, thank you very much, Tom. Lazy. It's just lazy, isn't it? I thought we'd start with a little bit of background. Most of the time you see about tsunamis in the news these days tend to be news-related items with Asia. I think of the Thailand tsunami in 2004. There was the Japanese tsunami that nearly took out the nuclear power station at, was it, I was going to say Fujitsu, but that's not quite right, is it? Fukushima. You have to say that one carefully as well. Uh, and essentially, those sort of tsunamis are all triggered by earthquakes underneath the ocean, where the ocean floor very rapidly moves, maybe up to 10 meters. And that puts a lot of energy into the ocean. And it's a bit like dropping a pebble in, into, the, into the pond. Uh, you move a lot, lot of water very rapidly. You start to give a, produce a wave. And if you know the depth of the water, you know the gravity, you can calculate how fast that wave's going with a very simple equation, uh, the sort of level of equations that I like. But the point of the slide is that these waves are very fast, moving at 700 kilometers an hour across, so they can cross large oceans very quickly in a matter of hours. The top part of the slide, I want to make the second point, which is that Whilst these waves as they're going across the ocean might be really uninspiring, maybe up to 50 centimeters, something like that, very long frequency. You probably, if you're in a boat, you wouldn't really notice them. As soon as they get close to land and uh, the water depth starts to shallow, that's when we start to get the impressive waves and uh, the dangerous waves that cause all the destruction that we saw horrifically portrayed in Japan uh, not so long ago. But there's two other sorts of uh, tsunamis, if you bear with me. Uh, there's these ones, which are the kind of Hollywood tsunamis, because it requires an extraterrestrial asteroid uh, plunging down on Earth and hitting the world's oceans at some point. Uh, 
uh, as uh, depicted in the table, thankfully these, don't, these asteroids tend to not happen too often, but we could expect something with a 50 meter diameter uh, once a hundred years. Of course, that might not actually hit the world's ocean, but if it did, then you'd have uh, a tsunami of order of about 12 centimeters. Or you could have a really big one up to two kilometers, which might hit the earth once every million years, in which case you'd get a very large tsunami in the region of 230 meters. And as shown up there, perhaps the, the ultimate example is associated with the 66 million year extinction event uh, when the asteroid hit uh, the Yucatan Peninsula. It was about 14 kilometers in diameter and people uh, Cornei 2018 calculated that near the impact, you'd have had a tsunami in the order of 1,500 meters, which doesn't bear thinking about, it's so large. Uh, and even in the deep ocean of the Pacific, you'd have had a wave about 14 meters. But it does exemplify why one small asteroid hitting the remote part of Mexico could have very quickly global ramifications in terms of its impact. The other type of tsunami, uh, and more pertinent to this court, is uh, related to landslides, be they submarine or rock falls or volcanic collapses. Uh, and a classic example of this in the literature comes from 1958 from Alaska, where 30 million meters uh, cubed of rock fell only 900 meters. So it wasn't a huge landslide. Uh, on, as shown on the right hand side of this in red, it dropped off this mountain. It crossed this little bay, only 1.3 kilometers in width. It crossed that at 160 kilometers an hour. And the wave had so much energy from that landslide that it was able to climb uphill to an altitude of 524 meters the other side, ripping off all the soil, vegetation and sediment as it did so. And you can see on the left hand photograph, uh, just in this area, this is the landslide after the tsunami, and we've just got a bare hard rock surface left after that tsunami impact. So tsunamis tend to be Small in the world's oceans, but it can be vast in shallowing circumstances. They travel very quickly. And not only are they large waves, they have a lot of energy, and therefore the run up of those waves can be uh, uh, quite extreme. But I'm coming here today to talk about the North Sea. And clearly, as shown in this diagram on, the, on your right, uh, is the seismicity map of Europe. And the, the seismicity map of Europe uh, would suggest, as shown in red, that there's lots of activity and therefore lots of potential for uh, tsunamis in the likes of Greece, Turkey, and Italy. And then if you start looking through the historical records, there's lots of evidence of tsunami impacts in the Mediterranean. So we have the Sicilian earthquake in 1693. It was 7.4 on the Richter scale. Uh, destroyed 70 towns, cities, destruction of about 5,600 kilometers squared. But in the small print, you can also see in the document that they caused three tsunami waves, infected about 230 kilometers of the coastline. And those waves were up to about eight meters high and penetrated in 1.5 kilometers. So people perhaps mesmerized by the, uh, the, the mortality rate associated with that and may, the, the tsunamis uh, may have got under the radar. Moving forward in time, 1783, again in Italy, 25,000 casualties caused by a Richter 7 uh, earthquake. Again, more tsunamis. Uh, this time we have records that the tsunamis directly killed 1,500 people and uh, that that tsunami reached about nine meters above sea level and about 200 meters inland. And then 1908, Messina earthquake uh, destroyed about 600 kilometers squared, killed about 82,000 people. We had tsunami waves associated with that three meters high, at least three waves lasting many hours. And they actually attribute about 3,000 deaths to the, the waves themselves, maximum flooding up to 10 meters above sea level. My personal favorite, and this is just complete and utter bias because it was the first paper I ever got co-authorship on, was related to the 1755 
uh, Lisbon earthquake. And it's interesting in one sense that uh, if you start looking at this map, we get all the way over to Lisbon, it's not in a high seismicity area, uh, but there are lots of faults uh, just off the, the, this map here, uh, uh, which triggered this particular tsunami. It was 8.7 on the Richter scale, located just offshore, killed about 60,000 people in, 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 in uh, uh, Lisbon, caused churches to fall down, fires. The quote I put here, I particularly like, soon after the shock, which was near the high water, the tide rose 40 feet higher, and in an instant, and then ever known, and suddenly subsided. So these things happen in blink of eye, and all this death and destruction and, uh, and ripping up uh, of sediments and rocks very quickly occurs, and then it disappears again. So that's the wider background, but of course I've built my talk to talk about the North Sea. So you're probably sitting there going, well, why is he talking about Lisbon other than it's a nice sunny place that we'd all like, one day like to go to, COVID permitting. Uh, the North Sea is quite an interesting sea in that it's 970 uh, kilometers long. It's about 580 kilometers wide, uh, but it's very shallow. It's only on average 90 meters uh, deep. And as you can see from this diagram, a lot of the colors shown in yellows and red, the, the, sh the shallowness of the North Sea is it's less than 40 meters. So the Southern North Sea, including uh, scarily the busiest shipping lane in Europe, in which I believe oil tankers regularly scrape the bottom because it's down to about 24 meters in de depth, uh, uh, is uh, uh, a very shallow sea, as I say. And that, it's been a great boon to the wind industry having such a shallow sea for offshore wind farms. And obviously it's helped a lot with the oil and gas reserves in making some of those more accessible. What's been noted over the years is there's been lots of reports of tsunami sediments going from northwest Norway, uh, right the way around into Scotland and the Shetlands and beyond. But I've just shown you a seismicity map of Europe, and you probably sat here now thinking, well, how can you have the tsunami if it's in a low seismicity area? Uh, it's dated to 8,150 years ago. What caused it? And I guess the, the top of the class would be already thinking exciting meteorites and landslides and caldera collapses. And you, one of those answers is probably right, because it, it was actually caused by a submarine slide occurring in the area marked in the red on this diagram, which is the Sturega slide. And where's the example I gave you from Alaska it was quite a small slide. The Sturega, I think, has to be classified in the ginormous category. It moved somewhere between 2,400 and 3,200 kilometers cubed of sediment. It affected where that sediment moved with an area of about 95,000 kilometers squared. And I've looked it up, and that's larger than the entire nation of Scotland. And if you add up all the volume of material carried by the world's rivers each year and times it by 300, that's the amount of material that was moved in an instance in this Sturega slide. Absolutely vast. The head wall alone is 300 kilometers long. And so we got these wonderful diagrams that Bern et al. 2005 produced, showing exactly under the ocean off Norway uh, where this occurred. And it's shown in this little red box here. And we've got this continental shelf break where the waters very rapidly descend from about 250 meters of water depth to over 3,000 meters. So it's a very steep slope on which this uh, landslide occurred. Uh, and right on the edge of the continental break. What's thought to have occurred is that when the Fenno Scandinavian ice sheet expanded during the last glacial period, it moved up to that continental margin and then could progress no further because it was in deep water and it ground to a halt. Uh, but when it started retreating as the climate warmed up, so the sediments that had eroded 
rapidly got deposited at that continental margin, probably cascading over that continental margin edge. And so as depicted on this slide by Burnett Howell, you've got all these blues and green sediments being stacked up on the landscape, on the, right on the edge of the continental margin by this glacier, uh, or by this ice sheet, I should say, over a very short period of time. Modeling by Henry Patton, 2017, tends to suggest that the Fenno-Scandinavian peak melting occurred uh, in two pulses, one about 15,000 years ago, and one about 12,000 years ago. So very great thicknesses of sediments, very rapidly deposited, over a very short period of time, tottering on the top of the continental margin. It was a doomed scenario, wasn't it? But what actually triggered the, the slide itself? Three theories have been put forward. I'll give you them all and we'll take a vote at the end, if you like. I have my personal favorite. Uh, fault movement, methane gas release, or rapid sea level rises. What caused the tsunami? Can we get rid of this? Yeah, on more. On more. There we go. And then you can see the titles of the slides. Um, yes. So what caused this? Oh, is it frozen now? <laughs> right. Sorry, you don't get to see the tide slides. So in terms of fault movement, it's entirely plausible because the Yan Mayan fracture zone as shown here, uh, up here, has more minor fissures and faults extending towards the coastline of Norway. And it's entirely possible that with all this sediment loading, we could have seen some movement of those fault lines and that could have triggered uh, uh, the precipitous uh, uh, landslide of the Sturega event. It would be a bit like, if I can get it to work, Jenga. Do you remember the Jenga game? So you've got all these sediments tottering on the top of the slope, and then suddenly you give it a good shake, someone bangs the table leg, it seems to happen in my household, and off it goes. The second theory relates to methane gas release. Similar situation in terms of you've got the stacking up of the sediments, but some of those sediments will be sufficiently porous for methane to uh, move through and maybe sufficiently capped that it gets trapped. And if that methane becomes pressurized, you can therefore reduce the friction between the grains and you've got yourself a sliding plane, which could then uh, trigger off this, uh, the, the Strigger uh, landslide. The evidence for this, I guess, is the fact that as shown in this diagram from Burnett, how uh, we've got the, the gas field sitting where the arrow points with the white, which is just at the scarp slope or the scar or the back wall of this. So we know that there's uh, um, methane uh, being a, a, an oil reserve sitting underneath that point and gas has been pumped out of there. What I personally think is a less likely scenario is that it was triggered by sea level rise. I put it up because I still think this slide's quite shocking. If we go back nine and a half thousand years, sea levels, Globally, we're about 10 meters lower than they are today. And you, in a space of about a thousand years, uh, they rose up by six meters, which is quite incredibly fast, moving at about six millimeters a year. That has nothing to do with the Strega story. What um, um, David Smith thought was that it was this zone here where sea levels were rising at the rate of almost 21 millimeters a year he thought connected to the tsunami. But let's just pause about 21 millimeter sea level rise. It's almost an inch in whole bunny. So every 15 years, the sea level would go up a foot. So in your lifetime, you could expect to see the sea rise more than your head height. That's quite scary, isn't it? That would make huge differences. But his idea is that sea level was moving at such a rate that it loaded up all these tottering sediments stood on the continental margin and crossed some sort of threshold 
uh, which therefore uh, led them to collapse, uh, forming the Strega slide. I mean, I've done some schoolboy type maths and the Strega slide sediments were sitting in 250, 280 meters of water. It's a surprising sea level rise, but you're only adding two or three extra meters during that time period. And I can't, unless it's a really critical threshold that no one, I can't see the pressures changing uh, that much uh, with two or three meters of extra sea level on top of the uh, 250 to 280 meters already there. If you're interested, currently we're, we're rate, sea levels rising at about four millimeters a year. Think of all the cri climate crisis and the poor nations in other parts of the world that are not coping with four millimeters and then think what the hoo-ha would be if it was 21 millimeters a year. So what do these sediments look like? We've got this big event. People have said there's a tsunami. What's the evidence for the tsunami? What does it look like? Well, the evidence I feel is fairly com com compelling. This is evidence by Bondovic uh, from the Shetlands. And we've got a series of estuarine silts and peats sitting underneath the tsunami sediments. And we can see in this photograph that the top of those peats have been completely ripped up into lots of class. So we've got all of a sudden we've gone from quiet plants decaying, not doing much to some high energy event that are gonna be ripped up and deposited. And we've got lots of clastic sediments and quite large clasts. So obviously something powerful has arrived, causing erosion, moving large sediment, and then a very, very sharp top to this boundary. So it just stopped. Everything settled out. And then it went, oh, let's go back to forming P. That was, that's nice and quiet, let's do that. So that's the evidence from the Shetlands for, for the tsunami. And for north, uh, northern coast of Scotland, uh, Loch Eribong, uh, again, we've got peats that's been contorted and we've got clastic sediments all of a sudden, and then it's going back to peats. So there's a pattern. Nice quiescent, low energy environment, depositing peats or estuarine silts, high energy, clastic, and back to low energy. So people, once people got their eye in, people started seeing tsunami deposits all over the place. And I've just put some dots on. But the idea is that if you're close to the Sturega slide itself in Norway, uh, you can find those deposits up to 10, 12 meters above sea level, indicating that the wave was very large at those more distal places. Uh, for example, on the east coast of Scotland, three to six meters. Eagle-eyed amongst you will notice there's two numbers that don't fit in with that trend. The lucky people on Pharaohs and the lucky people on the Shetland Islands got a special treatment. They got extra big waves, but that's mainly because of the orientation and configuration of the coastline with lots of funneling uh, bays, which were able to funnel the waves. And so the waves where they've been recorded in the sediment are actually much larger uh, than on nice flat coastlines like the east coast of uh, Scotland. So there's evidence of about 600 kilometres of uh, northeast Scottish coastline of impacted northern coastline. And there's even sites that have been attributed to the Sturega Sion sky. So you've gone all the way around. So John Hill, back in 2014, thought, well, that's great. You've got geologists showing sediments, point sources. Wouldn't it be fantastic if you could put together a model that started to join the dots? Uh, if the technology works, this is his model that joins the dots. What he did, he took a simple slab of sediment, dropped it off the continental margin in the right place off northwest Norway, and then computed what would happen to the sea surface elevation as effect, so the ripples. He treated all the coastline as cliffs, infinitely high cliffs. So there's no growing of the waves as it gets into shallow water. They're all vertical cliffs, and we'll come back to that point later on. But this is what the model, when you see blue, that means that the water's lower than it should be. And when you see red, that's where you've got the tsunami waves where it's higher than it should be. Is this going to work? 
And now, it was working. What do you want me to do, Tom? So I get rid of this laser pointer. Work, work seeing, it? oh, it's, oh. it's just needs Tom to stand by it. That's what it needs. Thank you. So as I say, where you see red, that's the tsunami wave rippling out from where the slide. You can see it gets as far as Greenland. It gets up past uh, Iceland, uh, and then it goes off into the Atlantic. So in theory, this wave and this tsunami could have far-reaching effects and could be found far further afield than the sedimentary evidence that we've seen uh, so far. I think it's just worth playing it a second time because, sorry? Okay. It's worth playing it a second time. I just want you to focus in on the North Sea Basin this time and try and count the number of waves that will go into the North Sea Basin because it's this enclosed embankment. It's got nowhere to go. So here we see the first large red wave heading from the north, coming down, starting to impinge on the coastline of Scotland uh, and moving on down into England. Then there's a series of fairly indistinct waves as it starts to bounce around. And then we start to see another very major wave coming down uh, through Scotland, according to this model. So we might expect not only did the Sturega slide cause tsunamis, but it caused multiple waves associated with those uh, this tsunami event. No, have you done it? Twice is enough, I think. So what the model enabled John Hill to do is to take uh, any point on the model and calculate how many waves would have hit that particular point in the coastline and also what the maximum elevation. And uh, you can see that, for example, if we take the, uh, uh, the Shetlands, uh, this one here, we've got something in the region, according to the model of waves in excess of 12 meters hitting them and quite a complicated pattern. Uh, go elsewhere, if we go to more distal places, closer to where the slide actually occurred, we've got in the region of waves uh, nine to 13 meters high. So broadly speaking, it's following the similar sort of pattern but in many cases, the model is underestimating the number of waves and the magnitude of the waves. Probably the geology is underestimating it as well because we're only finding plastic sediments and the wave would have probably extended further inland and left finer sediments that haven't survived uh, and gone even further, not carrying any sediments at all. So there's this mismatch between the geological model evidence and the, uh, and, and, and the ones uh, that the modeling of showing. So this got me thinking uh, and it gave me an excuse to go up to the Montrose Basin and start to think about how I could do some contribution to the tsunami, Sturega tsunami story. And one of the things that struck me was that a lot of people over a large number of years had run around Scotland looking at Strega tsunami deposits and then taking radiocarbon dates from the peats above and the peats below. And one of the things that struck me is that if you've got a violent event like a tsunami that you know is going to have eroded the landscape as it came in, surely any dates you get from peats underneath the tsunami are gonna overestimate its age because you know you've got erosion taking place and some of those peats would have been lost and moved away. And equally, once if you take dates from peats sitting above the tsunami sediments, surely if you dump a load of rocks and sand across the landscape, as soon as the tsunami wave goes back, you're not instantly going to get peat forming processes. You've changed the drainage, you've changed the elevation of the landscape. And then this could be quite a hiatus while those salt marshes and other coastal peats start to form. So these radiocarbon dates bracketing the tsunami aren't exact science. And that's before you go into the fact that some were done in the 1960s on random bits of peat rather than nice macros using the latest radiocarbon techniques. So there's no direct date. So 
people have gone around saying, oh, there's a tsunami, that's Storega, there's a tsunami. Is the Scottish stuff really the same as the stuff in Norway? was my question. Uh, and can we do better to find out directly whether the sand itself uh, is related to the 8,150 year event? And then can we use the geological evidence to find out how many waves, where they came from, what direction, and try and tie the picture in together. And as Graham said in his introduction, I run a luminescence dating lab. Has anyone come across luminescence dating before? I'm glad I put this slide in then. Phew. So it turns out, just like rechargeable batteries, sand grains have properties that when you shine sunlight on a sand grain, it lo they lose their charge. Just like a rechargeable battery, if you leave it in the torch and your torch is switched on, it will eventually go flat. Sand grains, when they're buried as forms of sediment, absorb background radioactivity from their surrounding and recharge, just like you putting your torch batteries on the charger. So the bigger the charge in the sand grain, the longer it's been buried for. So if you can measure using luminescence, we use a, shine a laser on the sand grains and torture them into giving out how much charge they've accumulated through time. If you can then work out what the level of background radiation is in, in a particular area, and you know how much dose it's had in total since it was buried, and you know how much dose it's getting per year, you can actually find out how long it's been buried for. I'll answer questions at the end, but that's the, the, the rough, rough, but the important bit is I can take a, tain, set tain, a sand grain and tell you how old it is. So I thought I'd toddle up to the Montrose Basin. It's a fantastic environment. You've got the town of Montrose here. It's got this very narrow inlet into the Montrose Basin, this huge intertidal uh, basin. And it's the one place that, I, that I, you can reliably go and see Storega tsunami deposits without having to take boring equipment or coring equipment because the coastal cliffs along this side of the Montrose Basin are eroding away and they're just there and you can walk up and go, Storega tsunami. If you want to get a slide like this with it all nicely cleaned up, you need to get special permission because it's a triple SI and you have to go and talk to the right people and get right permissions because they're very concerned about the fact that it's eroding away and they don't want too many people with spades digging at it. So the first question, which you can't see, but I can, is, is the Montrose sand a tsunami deposit? So I looked at the geochemistry of the overlying estuarine silts, the sands that everyone says are tsunami deposits, and the estuarine silts in below. I just picked out a few uh, for you, but I think I can demonstrate quite clearly that whatever the sands are made of, they're made of exotic material. It's not just the same old minerals that are washing in and out as the estuary, as the intertidal basin recharges and empties, uh, at, but bigger, sand grain, uh, bigger size grains. Very different geochemistry in chromium, copper, hafnium, thorium. And then, of course, if you look at the particle size, Surprise, surprise, the sand grains come out at sand sizes and the silt grains come out at silt sizes. But the point of putting this slide up is that you've got a very different energy level in terms of depositional environment. You're going from estuarine silts, which need pretty much still standing water to deposit, to sands which need flowing water and velocity. So taken together, you've got a situation where we've got a high, sudden high energy environment bringing in exotic materials, starting to sound like a tsunami really, isn't it? In such an enclosed embayment by, the, embayment by the coast. So yes, I'm quite happy that uh, Montrose Basin sediments are tsunami related. Then my first challenge I set myself is, is it of the same age as the Norwegian stuff associated with the Storega slide itself. So the little uh, pot that you can see sticking out here is this is my little container. I had to collect the sand grains without getting them exposed to sunlight because that would upset the stored charge. And then I took them back to the lab and dated it. Phew, comes back bang on Storega, 8,100 years plus or minus 250. So yes, 
We have tsunami deposits. Yes, they're definitely Sterega at Montrose. So where did these sands come from? What direction did the, the tsunami hit? Well, thanks to the efforts of the British Geological Survey, there's a whole host of potential sediments which have got siliclastic material or sandy material, which could have been formed what we find at the Montrose Basin. There's the lava group, there's offshore sandy, muddy Holocene stuff, uh, there's sandstones, a uh, whole host of things. But having had a quick look around, and you're the geologists, not me, I came to one conclusion very quickly, is that the hard rock in this area is definitely very hard rock. One wave is not going to make some of those lavas suddenly crumble into a sand bed uh, uh, that could then be deposited. So really, the tsunami had to be eroding and transporting sediments. And if you look at the super superficial geology, uh, then we've got glacial tills, which are mostly clay, not much sand in those, so they can be ignored. But we've also got raised marine deposits, both uh, Pleistocene and Holocene, and some glacial fluvial deposits. So what I did is I ran around taking samples of these different units, and again did a bit of geochemistry to try and see which ones were most like the tsunami deposits. It's not smoking gun data, Here's the estuarine deposit sitting above and below the tsunamis. Here's the raised marine uh, beach sands and current dune sands, and here's the tsunami. And we've got a little bit of an overlap. It's closest to these marine beach sands uh, in both diagrams. So what I think this means, my interpretation of this anyway, is that we've got a very proximal source. So the wave came in to the Scottish shallow uh, environments, picked up some local sediments and move them across uh, the, the Montrose Basin. And as luck would have it, when you go and look at the uh, yellow near Teok, uh, this is very unconsolidated sand. This is part of the marine sand. Uh, and you can see there, it's just a pile of sand, beautifully bedded. I could knock a plastic luminescence tube in there by hand, no geological hammer required. It's interesting that happens to be where the, uh, the cemetery for Montrose is. And I think the grave diggers have worked out this is the, much the easiest sediment to dig into compared to the tills and other rocks around there. Did another luminescent sample to find out if it would be in place at the right time. And it's older than uh, the Sterega. So yes, it would have been in the environment when the wave hit that coastline. If it had been younger, we would have had to have ruled it out. So I think what happened is the wave came from Norway and eroded part of that uh, raised marine sands and then moved it all the way across to the little star numbered one, which is where the site Montrose site was. So it just effectively moved it a short distance across the embayment and then deposited it. So you get a start to get a feeling that, yes, it was a regionally huge event, but maybe at a local scale in terms of long, long, um, long term landscape evolution and modification, it was only very cosmetic. I then got on to John and said, you can do a better job with your model. He didn't take kindly to that comment, um, but I said, did you know that the cliffs, of, and the cliffs of Scotland aren't infinitely high and that some places have beaches? Could you build that into your model? And he said, yes, but it would be computationally very difficult. So I said, well, could you build a model just for the Montrose area, not the whole of the North Sea Basin? He said, yes. And this is what's shown up here. He takes his original 2014 model, and as the wave comes into uh, the nearshore area to mark demarked by this red line. So he starts to increase the resolution. And so that by the time it's getting to the coastline, you can see these nets are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And that reflects all the calculations that are going on, increasing resolution as it gets closer and closer to the shoreline. And it's got a coastal inundation part to the program there. So the wave doesn't just bounce off random cliffs that don't exist. It starts to get bigger as it gets into the shallow water and it can extend onto land 
if it is higher than the present day landscape. Very exciting. So we ran it. And we were very disappointed. Why were we disappointed? Well, there were some positives. What we managed to do is get a wave that was coming from 88 degrees north, which in the scheme of things, the wave was coming from the right direction from the Montrose Basin. We also got two to three waves, which seemed quite plausible uh, based on what we'd seen elsewhere. But the big thing was that the wave height was only 1.6 meters as shown by this graph. And if you look at the inset map, each of these stars are where geological evidence have been found for the Strega tsunami in the Montrose Basin. The model shows the inundation shown in this dark blue, and you can see that three of the four stars are still sitting nicely in the green, showing that they weren't inundated, according to the model. The only one that he managed to get wet was the Montrose Basin one, which I and that's at zero meters OD anyway. Not too hard to get something to make that wet. So that was quite upsetting. Gone to all this effort, he's improved his model, doesn't really work. And then I had this kind of, I don't know about you, but I have a lot of good thoughts in about 2 a.m. in the morning. I just wake up and things go bing. And I thought, hmm, John's doing all this modeling uh, and it doesn't work with the geology, but we've got all these Holocene sediments. What if those Holocene sediments formed and were deposited after the Sterega event? We're trying to get the wave to crash over a, a landscape which wouldn't have been there. And we're trying to force the wave to come through this very narrow inlet into the Montrose Basin. What if we took these out and you think, yeah, okay, well, we could, it's a model, you can change anything in a model, can't you? It doesn't necessarily make it better, but you can still do it. But there's no point in doing that if that's a bedrock seal. But fortunately, when they put the road bridge across to Montrose, they did some boreholes, and there's a second borehole just here, which showed that it's all unconsolidated sediments down to minus 24 metres by the bridge and minus 17 uh, on the coastal corner. So there's no intrinsic reason in terms of the hard rock geology why uh, that spit of sediment had to be there at the time of, uh, of the Montrose, uh, of the, the Sterega tsunami. And in fact, if you look at the borehole logs, most of it is actually marine sands. Uh, and so it's probably of a similar sort of age or, or younger uh, than, than, uh, than the, uh, the, the source sands over here. So what we did was you just, very crudely got rid of it. But we've been quite conservative. All we did is we removed it down to zero degrees in terms of altitude. So I know there's sands going down to minus 17. So we could have taken a lot more out, but we just lowered it and saw what happened. And if you do that, all of a sudden, if we look at this inset here, now we get all the stars forming in the dark blue area. So where the model's saying inundation is occurring, so all our geological sites are agreeing with that. We're also getting wave heights in the order of uh, over five meters, so much larger waves entering uh, into the basin. So it all seems to start to come together in terms of uh, the modeling and the geological evidence coinciding. So we've got agreement. So if this works, this is the model, We've got Montrose, this is the, the Mon larger Montrose embayment, where you see red again is the tsunami wave coming, and you'll see the small wave, and then the water goes back out, then a big wave and massive amount of inundation, and then a second, a third smaller wave. Just run that again. So a small wave, a little bit of flooding, then a very large wave with pet water flooding up to 30 kilometers inland of Montrose, and then another small flooding event going on. So we think we've got a model that works and we can roll out to the rest of the coastline. We think in terms of elevations, the geology is now saying that we had waves up to about uh, six meters high. The modeling shows that we get waves up to six meters high. Uh, the particle size analysis, I did something slightly stupid, 
because the sands at Montrose are only about 13 centimetres thick and I managed to get 60 odd samples out of 13 centimetres of sand and individually work out the particle size distribution of them all. But it paid off because you can start to see a series of uh, fining up sequence. So it goes coarse, then fine, coarse, then fine. And then perhaps you can say coarse and fine, which would mean that you've got within those three waves, wave coming in, moving coarser sediment, then the water stills and stuff settles out, and then a wave comes in. Importantly, the, in terms of particle size, the second wave seems to be that have deposited the most sand, and that fits very nicely with the modeling, which suggests also that the second wave is the, the big one that hit Montrose. So we've got flooding up to six meters, probably run up up to 10 meters, flooding in the Montrose area up to 30 kilometers inland. It would have been a major impact on uh, the, the, the coastline of Scotland. If all the sites that have been measured around the coastline, 600 kilometers of coastline of Scotland, uh, hit by waves up to 10 meters high. What else can we say about the Strega tsunami? Well, I gave you the simple explanation in terms of luminescence dating, but there's lots of different traps within sand grains, and some of them take longer to reset under sunlight than others. So if you measure all these different traps, as I started to do up here, and you measure the quartz grains, they're very sensitive to sunlight resetting, right through to feldspars, which are less so, but if you increase the temperature up to 200, they're really hard to reset. Why am I telling you this? Well, the fact that we can get the right age for quartz and for feldspars starts to tell you something because you're looking at two signals which take different amounts of time to reset. And the sand grains have to see sunlight to reset. So what this means is that using luminescence staging, not only to get the age of the sediment, you can make a bold statement that the tsunami had to happen during daylight. So we now know that it was not a nighttime tsunami, it was a daytime tsunami. I was quite chuffed with that. Can't give you the precise time of day yet, but we're working on it. And that is quite a nice little, uh, there's another sub story in here that uh, this is all from the, the sand sample I showed you from um, the Montrose Bay, and we get the right ages here, but it also gives you older ages of about 12,000 years ago. And I believe those are the ages of the sediment from the other side of the bay that never got reset. So it took the sand from one side of the Montrose Bay, moved it, and, and those signals are still retained within the sand grains, showing that the sand that it moved was about 12,000 years old. The other key bit of paper I, I sniffed out was this paper. This is from Norway, where they found intact mosses within rip-up clasts within the Sturega sediments. And I didn't know this about mosses, but certain species have very uh, interesting plant uh, physiology. And in the first year, they grow like this. And then if the moss survives the second year, it has another branch off like this, which is called the mother. And then if it survives a third year, you get a daughter like this. And I think that's the end. What it enabled uh, Bongvik to say is that because he was finding uh, preserved mosses within the rip-up clasts uh, with this daughter branch on it, and that daughter only grows in the autumn, that I can say that the tsunami happened in daylight, he says that they could only happen in October or November. So we get the, the month and, and, and whether it's sunny or not, just not quite the date. In terms of the impact, looking further afield, uh, this is a, a slide put together by BBC News on the back of Tom's, uh, uh, John's original uh, model, giving you an idea of all the different low-lying areas on the south side of the North Sea Basin, which would have been inundated uh, by the Strega. And you can see very large kilometer squares uh, are, are, are being inundated. And although most of the good evidence, as you'd expect, would be in Scotland, many of the drowned out areas seem to occur down on the east coast of, uh, of England. So one of the questions I got, up, got thinking about is, does, did the tsunami mean that Britain became an island? 
Was it the traumatic event that finally cut us off from, from Europe? And I'm not using the B word in this. No, I'm not. And the answer is no. If you look at the best data available, uh, June 2020, left-hand slide as you're viewing it, this is what the coastline would have looked like 11,000, 10,000 years ago. We were still very nicely connected to Europe uh, with a large lake sitting in the southern North Sea Basin, which was probably connected through the English Channel. Move forward as the sea levels came up quite quickly, then we would have had a very small land bridge somewhere in the region uh, of 10 to 8,000 years ago, uh, 10 to 9,000 years ago, and probably uh, that land bridge was broken around 9,000 uh, onwards. So it, it's very, very much the case that that land bridge was already broken. We were all, already an island when tsunami from Sturega occurred. So the bit that was exposed in the North Sea Basin, you remember I said it was very shallow. Well, when sea levels were low, that wasn't sea, obviously it was land, it was called dogger land. And as those sea levels came up, uh, so Dogger Land became smaller and smaller, and it became Dogger Island, uh, and then small Dogger Island, and then, oh, look, that's where Dogger Island used to be. And it explains why trawl and men that trawl in the North Sea are constantly picking up very interesting artifacts, human uh, worked tools, mammoth tusks get caught in nets, because it was all once a very verdant, steppe-like grasslands that existed uh, for th th thousands of years during the last glacial cycle. Did the tsunami cause the end of Doggerland was the question. Well, again, this has been addressed by another paper. 10,000 years ago, you had a vast plain, sea levels came up, you've got the Doggo Island 9,000 years ago, uh, 8,200 years ago. So during the tsunami, you'd have had a very small Doggo Island, but it would have still existed. Interestingly, they also found three waves hit Doggerland, uh, and the, the Hill et al. model suggests that uh, the maximum flooding depth would have been about five, four to five meters would have hit this small island uh, sitting in the middle of the North Sea. The telling evidence, I think, comes from the organic material that has been recovered due to boreholes uh, because they're now putting wind farms on Doggerland. And so there's been a huge amount of work. BGS has been involved in this, I believe. And you can find the tsunami deposits, but sitting above the tsunami is pollen, which indicates that trees and shrubs existed post tsunami. And even me as a lowly geographer works out that trees don't grow underneath the sea. So it must have survived uh, uh, the tsunami event. And what they think was perhaps as much as 60% of the land surface of Dogger Island would have been inundated by the wave. It would have been extremely uh, traumatic for those living on the coastline of Dogger Land. It probably would have set back the island economy, the island ecosystem hugely, but it did recover. Uh, and it was really the slow, well, the rapidly rising sea levels that did for the island in the long term and caused the abandonment of Doggerland, not the tsunami itself. The other question I get asked is, oh, well, it's all great. It happened 8,000 years ago. Will it happen again? And this is probably why I got a lot of press coverage last summer. I've never written an academic paper that's had a headline like this before a horror report. <laughs> I've had referees comments on papers that have said that, but that's a different story. The question that the journalists love was that if Sturega happened exactly the same as I've modeled it, but now what would happen? And of course, I have to say, well, we think well, there were 10 meter high waves hitting the coastline. You look at the elevations of many of the great cities of Scotland, and there's a surprising amount below the 10 meter line. So places like Perth, Inverness, Aberdeen would have had huge consequences if it happened exactly like last time. And that's before you start funneling between islands and, and the, the chaos that would cause. So really the question is not what would happen if Sturega, it should be what would, is it likely that a Sturega 
type of tsunami event would happen again. And lots of people have ideas about this, as you can expect. Um, if the strega was um, caused by fault movement, where well, the fault lines are still there, so the trigger's still there. If it was form caused by methane, this is Botner et al.'s attempt to look at accidental methane release in part of the North Sea, and it's quite scary how much methane is being accidentally bubbling up through the North Sea, given its greenhouse gas tendencies. Uh, but there's lots of methane. So if that's a trigger mechanism, yes, we've still got the trigger mechanism in place. If it was due to the retreat of an ice level and rapid rise of sea level, I'm afraid the six millimetres, four millimetres a year that we're at the moment isn't rapid enough and we don't have that retreating ice sheet. So if that was the trigger, we're probably safe. If we look at other potential sources of triggers, we could look at the Canary Islands and think, well, they're quite volcanically active what would happen if one of those catastrophically exploded and we had a caldera collapse sim similar to Santorini? And yes, if that occurred, we would get tsunamis, but it probably wouldn't be impacting Perth and Aberdeen. They will probably be sitting quite happily in those circumstances. And the good people of Cornwall and Southern Ireland will probably be looking to get their wellies and their canoes out. However, talking to volcanologists, there's no evidence that the volcanic activity in, uh, in the Canaries has these explosive tendencies, is likely to have a caldera collapse in the way that's being suggested. Perhaps the most scariest possible area which we could look at for a future tsunami that could impact on the UK is actually Greenland. So Greenland at the moment, is rapidly melting because climate's very warm. It's rapidly pumping sediments out into the nearshore environment, onto the continental margin, and it's starting to stack, or it has been stacking those sediments, just like the Fenno-Scandinavian ice sheet did for the Sturega slide. So those sediments are being stacked up. Think back to the Jenga, they could be there. What we don't know is whether they've got to the Jenga-esque heights of a tower that makes them unstable. And what we don't know is whether there's a trigger. But people, uh, Stefan et al, 2020 said, well, what if uh, we had some sort of landslide like the Sturega, what would happen? And the impact would have caused tsunamis in the region of about seven meters to hit up, hit uh, uh, the UK. But in this case, it would be on the west coast. So once again, Aberdeen and Perth would be sitting there smiling. Uh, but the western isles and settlements on the western side of Scotland will probably get a double whammy. Because just like the Faroes and Shetlands, because of the, the locks, we would have an awful lot of funneling going on. So a seven metre general tsunami hitting the west coast of Scotland would probably generate waves in excess of 15 metres, 20 metres, when it got up all the locks and was funnelled. So that would be fairly uh, catastrophic, I think. The other answer to the question, could Sturega happen again, is that it has. And if you look in the literature, there's other evidence, including the original Bondovic paper in the Shetlands, which indicates not only the Sturega tsunami down here, but also a second tsunami up here. And he believes he's got evidence for a third based on this sand lens here. So potentially, certainly out into the, the Arctic Ocean, or certainly out into the ocean north, north of Scotland, there's evidence of more than one uh, tsunami event has hit uh, the Shetland Islands. So I've probably prattled on long enough um, we got lots of evidence that um, tsunamis have shaped the landscape. We need to be aware of those focus or the, the, what caused them and how far you are. 8,150 years ago, the tsunami did hit Scotland. It's probably, I think, the largest natural disaster to hit Scotland for 10,000 years. 
We've got evidence, 600 kilometers of coastline was Im impacted, least three waves, up to six meters high, those waves run off up to 11 meters, uh, probably flooding at least 30 meters inland, certainly in lowland areas. So large parts uh, of uh, estuarine systems in Scotland would have been flooded. And in terms of reshaping the coastline, probably didn't have a long term, major long term impact, uh, but uh, it did uh, shape uh, the, the coastline in terms of uh, helped with the demise of Doggerland and the people living on it, even if it didn't actually physically cause that final demise. So I'm going to stop there. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much.